Hello friend, I'm Pastor Augustus Corbett, the lead pastor of Saltmakers Church, a new church that we're bringing to South Dallas, Easter of 2018. Now God has equipped every believer with something that can make our lives so much easier, yet more productive. It's called the blessing. God never intended for us to grind life out. He armed us with power from on high. The same power he gave Adam, Noah, Abraham, King David, and Jesus. The problem is most believers know little about the blessing, although the Bible mentions it multiple times. For you, child of God, that's about to change. In this teaching, I'll introduce you to the blessing. If you catch what I'm teaching about the blessing and seek God for a greater understanding of the blessing, your life will change forever. You will become a very powerful and prosperous believer. Now, I taught this a little while back, but it's still relevant today. I hope you enjoy. Let's turn our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22. And we're going to continue teaching from the topic, the blessing of the Lord. Proverbs 10, 22 has served as our foundational scripture. And we're going to keep plugging at it tonight, talking about the blessing of the Lord. Proverbs 10, 20, 10 22 says, It is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. It is the blessing of the Lord. It is the blessing of the Lord that makes rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. Now, the last time that we were together, I gave you a definition for the word blessed or blessing. We said that it's from the Hebrew word barak, and it means to declare and to empower. To declare and to empower. And when we put the two words together, the blessing of the Lord, or the word blessing, is God's declaration of covenant favor that empowers a believer to painlessly manifest the kingdom of God in his or her assigned role. Once again, the blessing of the Lord is God's declaration of covenant favor that empowers a believer to painlessly manifest the kingdom of God in his assigned role. So what we're doing is we're taking Proverbs 10, 22, and we are breaking it down and we are exegeting this scripture. And we're breaking it down by commas. So everywhere there's a comma, we'll take that phrase and we'll define it or we'll unpack it. So the blessing of the Lord, comma, it maketh rich, comma, and he added no sorrow with it, period. So the first part of the verse, the blessing of the Lord, we now know that the word blessing is God's declaration of covenant favor that empowers one to painlessly manifest the kingdom of God in his assigned role. So now we say the blessing of the Lord is God's declaration because the Hebrew word barak for blessing means to pronounce, to say something favorably. And so the first part of the definition of blessing is to declare, to declare something. God says when you are blessed, he pronounces or declares that blessing in your life or he declares covenant favor. Now, in that declaration is the empowerment. So the declaration is pregnant with the power to manifest, if you will, painlessly, the kingdom of God in your assigned role. All of us have assigned roles. I'm assigned to plan a church. I'm assigned to be a lawyer. I'm assigned to be a husband. I'm assigned to be a father, and I don't have to do any of those things in my own strength because the blessing of the Lord empowers me to do those things. 
The blessing of the Lord empowers me to successfully plan a church, to successfully be a father, to successfully be a husband, to successfully be a lawyer. I'm a licensed attorney. And when I walk into the courtroom, I don't walk into the courtroom in my own strength. I walk into the courtroom because, and succeed at what I'm doing because the blessing of the Lord goes with me everywhere I go. And we said the blessing of the Lord is God's declaration of covenant favor. So you don't have the blessing without having favor. So when I walk into the courtroom, I walk into the courtroom with favor. When I'm negotiating with prosecutors or negotiating with insurance companies, I do so with the favor of God. Now the day is coming and I'm believing that God will, will enable me to uh, leave the practice of law and, and pass the full time. But until then, man, I am something else in the courtroom because I walk into the courtroom, unlike a lot of attorneys, with God's covenant favor. And that declaration of covenant favor in my life empowers me to do things and to accomplish things that other lawyers cannot, and it makes them shake their head. How is he able to do that? Well, the same is true with me as a father and a husband. Praise God, I have God's covenant favor upon my life. That is his blessing upon me, which enables me to be a successful father and husband. And whatever your role is, whatever it is, if you are a student, if you are CEO of a major company, if you are, um, if you are an entrepreneur, if you are a homemaker, a wife, if you are a mother, whatever it is that you do, and you are in the kingdom of God, that is, you are a Christian, a Jesus follower, you have the blessing of the Lord upon your life as well, which means God has declared covenant favor in your life, which empowers you to manifest painlessly the kingdom of God in your assigned role. Now, the next part of the, of the verse, it maketh rich. Now, there's some controversy about whether or not Christians ought to be rich. And there ought not be any controversy with that because the Bible's pretty clear that God wants his people, his children, Jesus followers, to prosper. And the word prosper doesn't mean, by the way, just having money, having an abundance of money. It means to excel in life. It means to achieve. It means to be successful. God wants his people to be successful. God wants us to achieve. He wants us to live in abundance. The scripture says that, that, that Jesus came to give us the abundant life. The, the enemy comes or the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but Jesus comes that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So when we see the word rich here in Proverbs 10, 22, again, some folks try to say that it means that God wants us to be rich spiritually. No, it, it, it means that God wants us to be rich in every area, spiritually, financially, maritally, mentally, physically. Yes, he wants us to be physically well, as well as to be emotionally well, as well as to be financially well, as well as being mar well in our marriages, well with our children, well in our family, well in every area of life. That is the will of God for believers. And it is the blessing of the Lord that makes us rich and he addeth no sorrow with it. Now that's the third part of the verse. And he addeth no sorrow with it. Now we said the word sorrow is a Hebrew word which is pronounced etzab and it means to hurt, have pain, and toil. It means to struggle. It means to grind. And see, a lot of folks in the world think that they are going to get ahead in life and excel in life and be prosperous and successful in life the more they grind it out, the more they struggle. Well, God is not, that is, that is under the curse. That is under the curse. We saw last week in Genesis chapter 3 that when Adam and Eve sinned and disobeyed God and uh, instead of, uh, of obeying the Lord, they followed Satan and bit into fruit from the forbidden tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We saw that, among other things, God cursed.
cursed Adam and Eve. God said to Adam, out of the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread. Well, that's a curse. That, that's what it means to toil. Toil means from a physical exertion and pain and struggle. Uh, Adam and the human family was going to have to try to make a living. You ever heard people say, I'm, I'm trying to make a living? Well, God never told us to make a living. God told us to activate the blessing of God in our life, and it would make us rich. And it would do so without adding sorrow. Praise God. There are a lot of people in the world who are rich, who have an abundance of finances, who have lots of things, but they also have lots of trouble. They also have lots of struggle and turmoil and weariness and distress. And they're working their fingers to the bone. They're grinding it out. They're banging their heads up against the wall. That is not God's will. God's will is for you to activate the blessing of God in your life, and that blessing will cause you to prosper and to excel. Now, we're still sort of reviewing material that we covered last week. We are going to get into some new material, but um, we um, need to review a little bit. Now, let's turn over to Proverbs chapter 23. Glory to God. Proverbs chapter 23 and we're going to read verses 4 and 5. Now I'm reading from the New American, uh, uh, New American Standard Bible. And it says here, I also have it in the King James. King James Bible says, Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. Will thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. So we see here, God tells us to labor not to be rich. Stop working to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Now the New American Standard Bible says, do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Goes on to say, cease from your consideration of it. For when you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. Now this is not telling us that wealth is bad. This is telling us, however, that we should not seek out the wealth and weary ourselves and struggle and toil and, and, and grind seeking after wealth. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these other things God will add unto us. So we don't have to seek out the riches and wealth in order to have those things. The blessing of the Lord in our lives will cause us to operate and possess those things. Now, we can't talk about the blessing of the Lord without also talking about the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of darkness. Now, there's a whole lot of talk in the body of Christ nowadays about the kingdom, the kingdom this and the kingdom that. And that's good because it means that God has given the church revelation to understand that what we ought to be focused on nowadays is advancing and establishing the kingdom of God to a degree. We'll never see the full uh, establishment and advancement of the, of the kingdom of God uh, until Jesus comes and restores all things, etc. But there ought to be some manifestation of the kingdom of God in the earth today. And God told me personally, I remember on an occasion I was seeking him about uh, trying to reach um, those um, who were having a hard time in life, and, and um, the Lord told me to uh, take them my kingdom. And that was some 20 years ago, and I've been endeavoring to do that ever since. And so as we understand the kingdom of God, we see that the kingdom of God is really the answer and the solution to all the problems that we see in the world. Now let's look at what the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God are. And we'll see that both of them are, one is a step, one is connected to the blessing of the Lord, and the other one is connected to the curse. 
All right, so the kingdom of darkness is the rule or the rim that Satan has authority. You could say it's the rule or the reign of Satan. Everyone born physically, everyone born physically of a man is automatically born into the kingdom of darkness. Everyone. Upon a child's birth, that child is automatically a citizen of the kingdom of darkness. Now, although the kingdom of darkness is defeated, it's still the cause of all the chaos in the world. So all the sickness, the disease, the fighting, the racism, the, the greed, the poverty, the, 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 all everything bad that you see in the world is a manifestation of the kingdom of darkness, and it is the result of the curse that's in the earth. Well, praise God, Jesus came, and he began, when he came, one of the first things he said was, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he brought with him the kingdom of God and manifested the kingdom of God. So now what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is the rule or reign of God. It's everywhere God has jurisdiction. Everywhere that God has jurisdiction. Everywhere that God rules. And our job as Christians is to manifest that kingdom wherever we are. So our job as a Christian is to manifest the kingdom of God in our families. Our job as Christians is to manifest the kingdom of God on our jobs, to manifest the kingdom of God at school, to manifest the kingdom of God in our businesses, in our neighborhoods. Wherever we are, our job is to manifest the kingdom of God. So now, that's why we said the blessing of the Lord, it is God's declaration of covenant favor, which empowers us to painlessly manifest the kingdom of God, and whatever role we're assigned in. So if we have a responsibility as believers to manifest the kingdom of God, how do we do it? We do it by the blessing of God. The blessing of God enables us to do it. So when we go into a, a neighborhood or a community that's having a whole lot of problems with crime and poverty and, and, and murder and gang infestation, we take the kingdom of God in there. How? Because the blessing of God that is upon us will enable us to painlessly manifest the kingdom of God in that community. And see, because the church does not understand what the kingdom of God is fully, we're not manifesting the kingdom of God in these neighborhoods. We're going to church. We're having a good time. Those of us who are of the Pentecostal holiness, charismatic persuasion. We'll go to church and shout out and sweat out a suit and sweat out a dress and just, just fall out all over the place. And I'm not belittling that. Thank God the Spirit of God will move on people and cause you to have a good time in the things of God. But there's more to being a Christian. There's more to being a Jesus follower than just having a good time. We also have the responsibility to take this kingdom into all the world and to preach this gospel, and to make disciples of all men. And so how do we do that? We do that because of the blessing of the Lord. So the blessing of the Lord is what enables us to manifest painlessly the kingdom of God in all the world. Now praise God. So, the kingdom of God, we take the kingdom of God into all the world, we take the kingdom of God into our neighborhoods. We take the kingdom of God into our communities because the blessing of God is upon us. It's upon us. Praise God. We are not, and I want to stress this, we are not supposed to be Christians who just, again, just have a good time in the Lord, who just have you know, just shout all over the place and just go to church and, 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 um, and, and pay our tithes. And those are good things. Keep doing that. But there's something else we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be advancing the kingdom of God. 
We're supposed to be establishing the kingdom of God. We're supposed to be preaching the kingdom of God. We're supposed to be manifesting the kingdom of God. We're supposed to be um, uh, advancing the kingdom of God in the marketplace. We're supposed to be advancing the kingdom of God in our jobs. We're supposed to be manifesting the kingdom of God in our communities. Amen. So when we see all these problems occurring in the neighborhoods and communities, uh, for example, in the inner city, you take, for example, Chicago. This summer, we've seen every weekend a bunch of teenagers dying and killing each other, and the church pretty much standing by doing absolutely nothing. Well, why is that? It's because they are not manifesting, the church is not manifesting the kingdom of God as we're supposed to. And why isn't the church manifesting the kingdom of God the way it's supposed to? Well, because many in the body of Christ don't understand the importance and the application of the blessing of the Lord. Because it is the blessing of the Lord that enables us to painlessly manifest the kingdom of God in our assigned roles. Glory to God. Amen. So now when we talk about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness, you need to see also that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness are diametrically opposed one to the other. So, for example, in the kingdom of darkness, you got the curse in operation. In the kingdom of God, you got the blessing in operation. In the kingdom of darkness, you got sickness and disease. In the kingdom of God, you got uh, divine health. In the kingdom of darkness, you got poverty. You got, you know, folks not struggling, not being able to, 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 to take care of themselves. They're living below their means and, and living under the poverty line, all of that. In the kingdom of God, when it's manifesting, amen, you got prosperity. You have abundance. In the kingdom of darkness, you got hate and fighting and war. But in the kingdom of God, you got peace, joy, righteousness in the Holy Ghost, you see. So these two kingdoms are diametrically opposed one to another. Now, another thing you need to realize about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness is the kingdom of God is superior to the kingdom of darkness. So no matter what's happening, that no matter what the kingdom of darkness is manifesting, when the kingdom of God comes in, it will drive out and undo the curse wherever you are. So if you, again, if, if the church goes into a community, and I don't care how bad that community is, if it goes into a community that's being ravaged by the curse through poverty, through sickness, through disease, through gang infestation, so forth, well, then the kingdom of God can come in and undo all of that. The kingdom of God can come in and replace all of that with characteristics of the kingdom of darkness. Glory to God. And that's what the church needs to see, that we need to be taking the kingdom of God into these communities, into our jobs, into our families, and driving that stuff out because the kingdom of God is superior. It's superior. Hello, this is Pastor Corbett of Saltmakers Church. Listen, I want to offer you a new mini book that I recently wrote entitled Your New Life in Christ. This book covers three things, the fall of man, the new birth, and the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Those three things are foundational for a believer. If you can get your head and heart around the new birth, the fall of man, and the baptism with the Holy Spirit, you have a solid foundation upon which to build your Christian life. And once that foundation is solid, I tell you what, you will become and can become a very strong Christ follower. But that foundation must be solid first. And that's what this little book does. And the thing that I also like about this little book is it can fit right in your shirt pocket. You can take it with you to work. You can take it with you to school. You can take it with you wherever you go and just keep it there as a reference, guys. And for you ladies, it fits very, very well in your pocketbook. So I would like to offer this little book to you. It's, it's only $1.99. You can order it from our website. Just go to saltmakerschurch.org or saltmakers.org and place your order. 
and we will get this book out to you. We are, we are sending this book all over the world, in fact. We, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we sent um, a bunch of copies to um, the UK. So it's going all over the place, and that's because it's a very solid book. It covers three very important topics for a believer, and, um, and it's convenient. It's something that you can just keep in your shirt pocket and take, take with you wherever you go. So again, Your New Life in Christ, you can order it from our website, saltmakerschurch.org or saltmakers.org. Get your copy today. You're going to be happy you did. And for you pastors out there, when folks get saved at your altar, you know you want to put something in their hands so that they can start reading it and getting that foundation and start that discipleship. This is the book that would serve that, that purpose. So um, contact us. If you order a large shipment, we'll certainly give you a discount. We're not trying to make any money on the book. We want to just get it out and get it into the hands of the folks. So. Uh, saltmakers.org or saltmakerschurch.org. Again, the name of the book is Your New Life in Christ. God bless you. The Kingdom of Darkness. Now, we said that the origin of the blessing of the Lord is with God himself. Obviously, the blessing of God is a part of God's just sort of natural self. It is a part of who he is. And then he shared that blessing, that part of his divine nature with human beings for the first time in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. We don't have to go there, but you remember, we looked at it last time when we talked about how God, when he created Adam and Eve, the Bible says, and he blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Well, I think we do need to turn over there. Turn back to Genesis chapter 1, 28. If you learn how to activate the blessing of God in your life, your life will never be the same. You will be operating in the same power and favor that Adam operated in to name all the animals, to name all the birds, to name all the, my God, it'll be, you know what? The blessing of the Lord will cause you to operate in all your mind, praise God, if you will. The scientists tell us that we don't use all of our mind, all of our minds, that we only use a percentage of them. Well, if you're operating in the blessing of the Lord, it'll be as if you're using every bit or at least more of your mind, praise God, and you will then begin to do some great things. In fact, there's a movie coming out. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not endorsing the movie, but I just did notice that there's a movie coming out. Morgan Freeman is in that movie. And there's a woman, the main character, is supposedly using all of her brain. And as a result of her using all of her brain, she's able to do some tremendous things. Well, that's what the kingdom of God will do. See, sometimes Hollywood will get a glimpse of revelation from the, from the word of God. Now they'll mess it up and they'll embellish it and they'll twist it and so forth, but they get a glimpse of it. And so um, that's exactly what happened. That's, that's what the blessing of the Lord will do in a believer's life. Now Genesis chapter one, verse 28 says, God bless them. Let's go let's look at verse 27. Look at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now let's read that again. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. In other words, let's make man to be like us. And let them rule, rule, let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his image, and in the image of God he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them. And when God blessed them, that's what empowered them to rule 
over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle. It was the blessing in Adam and Eve's life that enabled them to rule. Goes on to say, be fruitful and multiply and, 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 and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. How was Adam and Eve able to do that? Because of the blessing of the Lord. So now, the point is, you too can rule over the circumstances of your life. You too can rule over whatever confronts you when you walk in the blessing of God. That blessing was not just for Adam and Eve. It is for the human family. So everyone who is born again is translated from the kingdom of darkness and is no longer under the curse. And they then become a recipient, a participant in the blessing of the Lord. Now, if you would, turn over to Psalm 8. Psalms 8. Eight Psalms. Let's look at this a little more. Eighth Psalm. Verse 3, it says, When I consider your heavens, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? So the psalmist said, When I consider your great universe, the stars and the moon and the sun and all these things that you have created, he said, I, I wonder. With all these magnificent things, why are you so considerate of man? Why is man, in the scheme of things, so important to you? Verse 5, yet you have made him a little lower than God. You have made him a little lower than God. And you crown him with glory and majesty. Stop reading the Bible religiously and read what God is trying to tell you right here. Don't read it with that theological blind on your mind. Look at what this says. We're made a little lower than God. A little lower than God. Just under God. Just a little bit under God. And we have, the scripture says, glory and majesty. And you make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things, you have put all things, you have put all things under his feet. And all sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the pass of the sea. God has given us authority over all the works of his hands. He made us just a little bit lower than he is. Just a little bit lower than he is. You're not, oh my God, you're not just a, a clunk of dirt. You're the God kind. And now that you're born again, you have the seed of God on the inside of you. Now that you're born again, you have the nature of God on the inside of you. And you are an heir of God and joint heirs with Christ Jesus. You have, my friend, the blessing of the Lord upon your life, which enables you to rule over the earth. So when the devil brings stuff in your life to bother you, when the devil brings stuff in your life to plague you, you activate the blessing of God because you have authority over all of it. You have authority over the devil. You have authority over every demon. You have authority over the kingdom of darkness. You have authority over the curse. You have authority over sickness and disease. You have authority over all that the kingdom of darkness represents. Largely because of the blessing of the Lord in your life, praise God. Hallelujah. So we see here the blessing of the Lord 
it decks us out. It empowers us to walk in kingdom authority, to manifest the kingdom of God. Now, so we see here that the blessing of the Lord was first pronounced in Adam and Eve. But unfortunately, we know the story. They disobeyed God. And when they did, they lost the blessing. The blessing of the Lord was lost. But God was not lost. He knew exactly what he was going to do from the beginning. And so in Genesis 9-1, he reestablished the blessing in the life of Noah. And we walked you through how the blessing was then passed on down to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, on down to the Jewish community, on to Jesus Christ. And when we see the Lord in the Gospels, when we see him in the Gospels, we see him doing all sorts of things largely because of the blessing of the Lord in his life. Amen. Now, we're making good time. We're going to be getting into some new material here in just a moment, but I do want to look at um, Psalms 112. Let's look at Psalms 112, and I want to show you a little bit about the characteristics of the blessing of the Lord in our lives. Amen. This is what you ought to see in the life of a blessed person, man or woman. <clears throat> Psalm 112.1, praise the Lord. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord. How blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. Now here we go. His descendants or his seed, his children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, will be mighty upon the earth. So the blessed man's children will be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house. This is a picture of the blessed man. This is what God has in mind. Wealth and riches are in his house. And his righteousness endures forever. Light arises in the darkness for the upright. So when he's confronted with any kind of darkness in his life, what comes upon the scene? Light. Why? Because he's blessed. Because he's blessed. Goes on to say, it is well with the man, pardon me, he is gracious and compassionate and righteous. It is well with the man who is gracious and lends. He will maintain his cause and judgment, for he will never be shaken. The righteous will be remembered forever. He will not fear evil things. Why not? Because the blessing of the Lord is upon his life. He knows he will not fear evil tidings. The word tidings mean evil news, evil reports. He's not fearful of those things because he's confident that no matter what comes in his life, he's confident that no matter how the curse tries to manifest in his life, the blessing will enable him to overcome it. So what is there to be afraid of? So if the doctor says, you got this or you got that, he's not afraid of that. He's not afraid of that bad report because he knows the blessing of the Lord will empower him to overcome and to undo that curse. If, this, if he gets bad news about a job, well, the, the plan is closing. The, uh, you're getting ready to get laid off. Um, the economy is bad. There is a recession or a depression. He's not worried about any of that. Why? Because the blessing of the Lord will enable him to manifest covenant favor in the kingdom of God painlessly, amen, in his assigned role. So he's not concerned about bad news because he's blessed. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. His heart is upheld. He will not fear until he looks with satisfaction on his adversary. So we could keep reading here and see that the blessed man, because of the blessing of the Lord, he lives a life that's superior to everybody else, praise God. All right, now let's look over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, and let's get a new covenant, a New Testament view 
of how the blessed man lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. Second Corinthians 9, 8, one of my favorite verses of scripture. And God is able to make all grace, the word grace is defined as unmerited favor. And we just said that the blessing of the Lord is God's declaration of covenant favor in a believer's life that enables him or her to manifest the kingdom of God in his assigned role. So here now we're talking about grace. And God is able to make all grace, all favor abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Now, you, I don't know how anybody can read verses like this and still come out with the notion that God wants his children to live in poverty. I don't get it. This, this verse of scripture is very clear. And God is able to make all grace, all favor abound to you. Abound, that means in a big measure, in a large measure, <clears throat> abound toward you so that, so that always having all sufficiency, always having all sufficiency in everything, in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. That, my friend, is the blessing of the Lord. That is the blessing of the Lord in operation. Glory to God. Turn back to Romans 14. Romans 14. Talking about characteristics of the blessing of the Lord. Romans 14. 17. 14, 17 says, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So the man or woman who manifests the blessing of God in his life manifests the kingdom of God. And when the kingdom of God manifests, there is righteousness. There is peace. There is joy in the Holy Spirit. So there's, there are characteristics, more characteristics of the blessing of the Lord. Wherever the blessing of the Lord is, there's going to be righteousness. There's going to be peace. Amen. And there's going to be joy in the Holy Ghost. My God. All right, now, let me now begin to introduce you to ways that you activate the blessing of the Lord. We have spent the last three weeks just sort of wetting your taste buds and introducing you to the blessing of the Lord. Let's now talk about how to activate the blessing of the Lord. Now, why is that important? That's important because you can have a thing, but that thing may do you no good if you haven't activated it. I have gotten credit cards in the mail, and the credit card will come with the instruction. It has a, you know, a monetary limit that I can use to charge things and pay for it later. But I don't care if it has a $10,000 or $20,000 financial limit. Until you activate it, you can't use it. So there are many people in God's kingdom, many children of God, many Jesus followers, who have the blessing, all of us in fact, that are saved have the blessing of God. But many of us, I would dare even say most of us, don't know how to activate the kingdom of God, the, the blessing of the Lord. So, 
That's why you see believers who are blessed but broke. Blessed but sick. Blessed but defeated. Blessed but depressed. You ought not be blessed and stressed. You shouldn't be blessed and, and distressed. You shouldn't be blessed and perplexed. Why is someone blessed of the Lord yet not walking in that blessing? Because they got to activate the blessing of the Lord. Amen. Now, let's begin to talk about how to activate the blessing of the Lord. First thing, the very first step in activating the blessing of the Lord is... Number one, you got to renew your mind to the blessing. You got to renew your mind to the blessing. Hosea 4 6. Let's turn over to the book of Hosea and let me just show you quickly what we're told here in Hosea. Amen. The book of Hosea, chapter 4. You've read it. You've heard it. But I want you to read it. Hosea 4, 6. God says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. How can you activate something that you don't know you have? Or how can you activate something that you don't understand? Now go back to this credit card example that I gave you. I can remember getting all kinds of credit card offers. And the first page on the credit card says, follow these instructions to activate. Follow these instructions to activate. And so as long as you follow those instructions to the T, you can activate that card and begin to use it. Well, it is the same way in the kingdom of God. In order to activate the blessing of God, you must follow God's instructions to activate that blessing. And so the very first thing that you have to do, therefore, is to renew your mind to the fact that you're blessed. Now, renewing your mind, it means that you're replacing your old thinking with new thinking. Renewing your mind means that you're replacing old thinking with new thinking. You are updating or upgrading your thinking to bar computer terms. You know, sometimes computer software needs to be upgraded. It's outdated, it's worn out, doesn't function the way it needs to, and you have to do what? Upgrade it. And so renewing your mind is similar. You are replacing old thinking with new thinking. So when you renew your mind to the fact that you have the blessing of the Lord, you are replacing the thinking in your mind that has caused you to operate according to the curse. And you are replacing that thinking with the thinking that you are blessed of God. And because you're blessed of God, you have the ability, the empowerment to manifest covenant favor in the kingdom of God in your assigned role. So you don't have to take the devil's junk. You don't have to take, lay down, and let the devil just roll over you anymore. That is old thinking. That is old wineskin, if you will. That is kingdom of darkness thinking. It's time to upgrade and update your thinking. It's time for you to renew your mind. 
And so the number one and first thing that anyone has to do in order <clears throat> to activate the blessing of God is they got to renew their mind. Now, renewing the mind is a multi-level step process. In fact, I cover that in my book entitled Jesus Follower that shall be out not much longer. But I have time, just a couple of minutes, to mention a couple of things. First thing I want to mention about renewing the mind is, in order to renew the mind, you first need revelation. You first need revelation. You got you to you get new information. You got to get new insight. Secondly, repetition. Repetition. In other words, just hearing about the blessing of the Lord one time is not enough in order to renew your mind. You got to repeatedly hear this message over and 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 over again. Unlike reprogramming a computer, you just put in the new software, download it and upgrade it and, and it's done. Renewing the mind is not that easy. Renewing the mind requires that you receive that revelation again and 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 again. And as I talk about in my book, the reason you need to receive it again and again and again and again is because you have two minds. You have a conscious mind, you have a subconscious mind, and you need to get the revelation in your subconscious mind. What you're hearing now is going into your conscious mind, but your conscious mind doesn't often retain stuff long. It is in your subconscious mind where memories are established. There are some things that you can remember that happened in your life 30 years ago, 40 years ago, depending on your age, 50 years ago. Some things you can remember when you were a child, when you were a baby, when you were a toddler. Why? Because it's in your subconscious memory. And that's how you renew your mind. You got to get the word of God past your conscious mind and into your subconscious mind. And once you get it into your subconscious mind, your mind is now being renewed. How does that happen? First, by getting new revelation and by repetition. And we'll stop there. Amen. My time is up. Praise God. Let's bow our heads. I pray you caught this teaching on the blessing. If so, your life is about to change for the better forever. You now can operate in the same anointing and power in your daily life as King David did while he watched sheep on the backside of a mountain and protected them with his bare hands from a bear and a lion. King David did that because of the blessing. You too have that blessing on your life, child of God. Start functioning in it and start winning in life. Now, to learn more about our new church, please visit our website at saltmakerschurch.org. Our first service is Easter Sunday, 2018. We are expecting a great time and a great crowd. Please place it on your calendar and we'll keep you updated. Now I promise to keep teaching good quality word. Please check out our YouTube channel for more exciting teaching. We update it frequently. And remember these words from Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. I love you in Jesus, and until the next time, be blessed. <music>